So we're looking at the various source various noise control techniques. We've got source control, silencing, vibration, damping, vibration, isolation, enclosure. So I'm gonna, what I'm going to do now is run through the pros and cons of each of those. Okay, vibration damping. Um, the simplest way of talking about that is to look at this stuff. This looks like steel, sounds like rubber. It's basically... Um, if you have steel or uh, various other metals, if you hit them, they ring because they, they, they lose very little energy. If you coat it in rubber, when you hit them, rubber, if, what happens when you get an elastic band and you stretch it continuously? It gets warm because you're dissipating some of the vibration as heat. Then that's what you're trying to do. But if you coat something in rubber, what you're doing is unconstrained layer damping. And this is the one that's used quite commonly. Um, in your car, for example, you have bitumastic anti-drumming panels inside the door, car door to stop the, the car's doors radiating vibration and, and making the car sound noisier. Um, if you want to take a look at that, you have to take the lining off the door. Obviously, don't do it on your car because it's always impossible to get the lining back on again because all the little plastic clips break. Um, so just borrow a friend's car and have a look inside. Bitumastic anti-drumming panels. Now, that is what, what it does basically when, when you're... The vibration is bending the, the metal. What you're stretching, the rubber, where you're bending it, which dissipates some of the vibrationless heat. But very, very little. All the manufacturers of this stuff cheat. They hang up a piece, bing, 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 and then they have the rubber bit, and it goes dunk, 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 and they go, whoa. But you don't have bits of steel hung up. They're bolted <coughs> things, so you've already got quite a lot of damping for the bolted joints. This is an order of magnitude or two more, effect, more effective. And it's more constrained layer damping, and basically you are shearing the whole volume of the, of the layer. A company in Newcastle make it called Sound Damp Steel, and they make it in aluminium, stainless, galve, whatever. And basically they construct it with this um, glue in between, high viscosity, high damping glue between the two layers. So when you bend it, you are shearing the whole volume, so you're getting absolute maximum use out of the hysteristic damping. So it's very, very effective, and I say very mechanically strong and hygienic. This is rather a sophisticated application for the Mercedes A-Class. The supplier of the uh, electric motor um, for the power steering, there's a bell, this bell housing here with a motor inside it, uh, rang like a bell. That's why it's called a bell housing. It doesn't look, look like a bell, it also sounds like a bell. So um, they, were, they were thinking they're going to have to um, isolate this in the car and put an enclosure over it and all the rest of it, but then it heats up and it's also costly. Anyway, we convinced them to do some... We, I, we did a load of tests on it and said, look, it's just this bell housing that's the problem. Make it out of laminate. So what they did is they got the right grade of laminate and they stuck it through the same press that extruded, not extruded, um, formed the um, bell, the same press, the same tooling, a couple of slight adjustments, and they got something that was massively quieter, 19 dBA quieter. The noise from the electric motor drive on an automotive power steering system needed to be reduced during development. The main problem was motor rotor resonances excited at certain speeds. The following recording is of the rundown noise from a typical motor. I've got the wrong recording here, I'm sorry, but um, you get the idea. Um, and that's in a Mercedes, so you can't have that. You can't have that. So that's solved by doing that. So that, that's just an example of doing the diagnosis and knowledge of materials and how to approach things, because you, you can be very sure of what you're doing. Another thing that probably uh, make you, you've probably wondered on occasions, you're in your uh, hotel room and in the mini bar, in the fridge, in the little, mini, little tiny bottles, and you probably wondered when they, the bottles are empty, before they fill them, right, you've got a sort of um, a box full of little bottles and you tip them into some kind of machine, how do they get them all the right way up to fill them? You've probably wondered this. <laughs> sort of thing keeps you awake at night. Um, well, it's a, it's a hopper, and the hopper is bolted to the world, 
and they got vibrators bolted to the hopper. So what happens is they, they had to run the vibrators at very, very high levels to vibrate the hopper, which is connected to the planet. So accidentally, a little bit of the vibration got into the bottles to shake them up, and then they're fed into a feeder that turns and will make sure that all the ones that are the wrong way up get flicked off. So what we did was say, OK, the noise is generated by this big hopper with vibrators bolted to it, which is a loudspeaker. But you need the vibration to vibrate the bottles. So, but what we did was, this is the, we put a sheet of this stuff inside the hopper, so the bottles are resting on this, and isolated it using standard radio spare grommets, neoprene grommets. So it's isolated from the hopper, and then bolted the vibrators to this through the hopper. So this is isolated completely from the hopper. It's just a plate vibrating a lot. They could turn the vibrators down and still have a lot more vibration in the bottles. And it was 9 dBA off and cost them about 400 quid rather than an enclosure. And it improved productivity because you've got a lot more vibration being fed into the bottles and you can control the vibration being fed into the bottles very precisely. Now, this is another one that I find extremely annoying, weighing machines. Um, they're used everywhere, for sweets, for tablets, for Brussels sprouts, for anything that goes into bag, nuts and bolts, anything that goes into weighed bags. Okay? So you have your weighing machine on a platform, and underneath you have your bagging machine. And underneath, if there's an operator, that's where the operator stands. And the standard treatment across the industry is putting the enclosure around the top of the machine. But what this does is increase the noise level of the operator underneath by 2 to 3 dBA. Because that's where the guy stands, you're funneling the noise downwards, and it also makes cleaning and uh, whatever a nightmare. Now, we sorted this problem out about 20 years ago. The manufacturers know what we do but they make more money from selling you an enclosure. So a typical enclosure for these knocks the noise by between 5 and 10 dB, if you're lucky. That's on the platform. Underneath, it has no effect at all. What we do usually knocks the noise by between 10 and 20 dB and costs about 10 to 25% as much as an enclosure and has no effect on maintenance and so on. But it's a commercial decision by the suppliers to still sell enclosures which aren't best practice. So this particular one, um, 94 dBA with the enclosure and 82 dBA without the enclosure with engineering noise control techniques, which is damping, geometry changes, and a few other things. And so PP no longer mandatory. And cleaning was down from mo a whole day to just a couple of hours because you, you had to take the enclosure apart to get at parts of the machine. So that's the sort of thing, that's a, again, this is... This is one of the things about, um, you know, Chris was talking about people, manufacturers supplying noise data without the machine doing the job. You know, this, this is a shredder, but it's not shredding anything. Um, this is a similar thing. You know, it's a, commercial it's a commercial thing. And you can understand, if you're a manufacturer and you're in competition and, and noise does come up, you want your machine to be as quiet as possible, theoretically. So if everyone else is doing it without shredding or without using product going through, you're going to copy it. But it's not real. And similarly, in this case, it's a commercial decision by them to, to sell enclosures when they're not best practice. Um, this is a power press. Again, it, this punches out the base plates for oil filters on cars. Um, and they're going to fit an enormous enclosure to it. We looked at it, and the flywheel is generating 90% of the noise, like ringing like a bell. So dynamic vibration, as it was, absorb as it was. These are little lumps of metal bolted to the flywheel at the right place with, with cork gaskets tuned to the right frequencies. And that knocked 10 dBA off and cost about 20 quid in materials and a fitter for a day. So 
So the press looks exactly the same before and after, and it all fits inside the existing guards and no enclosure required. Um, here we got, here's a motor with a pump, a submerged pump. So the motor here, so the pump's inside this box, which is full of oil. Um, this box is another technical term, is a loudspeaker. Um, this is a motor pump unit bolted onto a big loudspeaker. And there's another one bolted onto a big loudspeaker to make sure it's as loud as possible. Um. This typical hydraulic power pack produces high levels of irritating tonal noise. The submerged pump is rigidly bolted to the oil tank. A large steel instrument panel is then rigidly connected to the tank. This design ensures the maximum noise possible. 89 dB on the tank, 88 near the pump, 91 at the bottom of the panel, rising to an impressive 99 dB up here. Now I find that really, really annoying because it's complete unnecessary noise. You know, it's, it, it wouldn't cost them anything to knock that by 10 dB, just by making sure good design principles during the manufacture and design of it. Um, vibration isolation, one of the key things is that people get wrong is short-circuiting it. So this is a fan with on, on vibration isolation mounts. Flexible connections everywhere. If you have a single rigid connection, you well, may as well not have bothered. You short-circuit it, all the vibration goes through and the noise comes back and the vibration comes back. So that's a very common fault. And here's an example. Um, this is a pump, a water pump. And you've got a water pump which is... Um, it needs to be aligned. You've got a coupling in between, but you need to have them rigidly aligned. If you have them too far out, you can't have them both mounted flexibly. So they put them on a nice big steel loudspeaker base plate to make sure they're really, really noisy. And then they bolt that to the concrete base and then they isolate that from the planet so the vibration doesn't go. But it's noisy. So what you should do is, is create, the simple, in this particular case, just make this out of laminate. And the noise goes away. This is a classic rubber bonded cork vibration isolation under a pump, a foot, a machine, a gearbox, whatever. If you look here, okay, this is a pump off the base. Here's the rubber bonded cork, but the bolt goes straight through. So they haven't, they, the engineer goes proudly, oh, we've isolated that. No, you haven't. You've jacked it up by six mil. You haven't isolated it at all. The vibration just goes through the bolt. You need something underneath the head of the bolt. You have to make sure that there are no short circuits. That's one of the really, really common things. This is such a simple thing to do in certain circumstances, and it's so cheap. Finishing off with a few other uh, common noise sources. Fans and pneumatics, um, co very common noise sources. And again, the same principle applies about diagnosis, is that um, if you're looking at um, fan noise control, for example, people think about silencing, that's it. Maybe an enclosure around a fan, a lagging, barriers, building modifications. They never think about noise control at source. And it is possible using aerodynamic modifications to reduce noise at source inside fans retrofit, let alone designing them in. We've approached most of the fan manufacturers with what we do, and none are interested because it's not their problem. Because fan manufacturers generally sell their fans to a systems house who put together filters and all the rest of it. It's their problem. If they need silencing, that's their problem. So, which is not a very positive attitude towards purchasing policy and so on. Um, our approach to fans, fan noise control, is to try and make the system as efficient as possible, first up. And a silencer doesn't do that. If you can make the system more efficient, you can run the fan slower, and you'll get more air for less power, which is win-win. For example, centrifugal fan, you often see a right-angle bend on the intake. 
all the air goes around the outside, you get massive turbulence, so the, the fan sees high and low pressure, and you just get a lot, lot more noise, and the fan is much less efficient. You need straight duct into a fan. Uh, for axial fan installations, it's fairly similar. You get this a lot. If you put a bell mouth on, you get much better flow, more efficiency, less noise. Up to 6 dBA we've had just by fitting a bell mouth. Um, also, anything that causes turbulence, um, uh, you just need two to three duct arms to straight duct between anything that causes turbulence and the fan to make the fan as efficient as possible. Um, so looking at fan noise control at source, the thing is, if you can make it more efficient, because fan noise is proportional to the fifth power of fan speed, a small reduction in fan speed gives you a large reduction in noise. So 10% reduction in fan speed gives you 2 dBA off, 20% gives you 5 dB off. So 20% reduction in fan speed means you reduced the um, noise by a factor of three. So that's a huge benefit. So, and again, it saves money. It saves carbon and all the rest of it. If you can get 50% off of fan speed, which we've done a few times, you get 15 dB off, which is massive, a factor of 30. So it just makes sense to make it as efficient as possible. For big fans and sophisticated systems, we actually do CFD modeling to work out to make sure we get it right. And as far as fan efficiency is concerned, it's all very sexy, but it takes a long time because it's still in, um, processor intensive. Hmm. And you were asking, Chris, about process fan. This is the uh, sort of granddaddy of an extract system because you're extracting aluminium cans, scrap aluminium cans off a line. And again, you, you're drinking a can of Coke and you think, I wonder how they get rid of the uh, bent, dent, can, dented cans that they don't want to put through production. Um, what they do is they use this fan to suck them off the line and then the fan itself shreds the aluminium cans so they can be recycled. So you then have, they installed these three system, new systems, and everyone for miles around complained and the noise level locally was, I can't remember now, about 95 dBA from the fan, something like that. So they were quoted 35 grand per system for lagging enclosures, special sciences so the cans can go through and all the rest of it. Aerodynamic inserts inside the fans reduced the noise by 22 dBA and sounded like this. <laughs> So this is a modified fan, looks the same as an unmodified fan. Costs them three grand per system, rather 35 grand. And it's the art of the possible. Just to saying these things are possible in certain circumstances. Um, this is another one, which was, again, but this was an environmental one, but the same principle applies. Um, they were quoted 100, 100 grand. This is a stack, they're 100 grand for silencing. They'd have, they'd have to move the fan because there's no space for silence, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it will be a downtime of 12 weeks, which is here. And then, sorry, that's the cost, 100 grand rather, and a downtime of, of over a month, and then increased running costs. Internal modifications, downtime was um, about four days, and it's 7% less power consumption for the same duty. So they're actually making money, payback of a year. Win-win. This one I really like just because... I'm weird that way. Um, these are boilers, and the standard technique for boiler noise is you turn your boiler house into an enclosure, eye-watering amount of money. Um, in this case, my colleague went along and said, I think I know what your problem is. Have you got a canteen? Can I get a, um, a yogurt pot? So they ate yogurt. And he went back and did a Blue Peter exercise with parasitism, nom, 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 nom. opened it up, fit it inside, there you go, problem solved. So all they do is they have a couple of aluminium yoghurt pots effectively inside their um, blowers. 16 dB off the um, prompt tones. That's looking at the aerodynamics inside burners, not altogether that well designed. In other cases, we've actually improved the efficiency of the burner by a few percent as well as this part of this process by reducing the noise as well. It's the art of the possible if you look at exactly what is causing the noise in the first place. <clears throat> Pneumatic silence of nozzles. Colin's going to be talking about that later on. Um, to be honest, it shouldn't be a problem, but it is everywhere. Wouldn't you agree? You, yours is your living. Of course you're going to agree. You know? But you go into virtually any industrial site, no, air noise everywhere, completely unnecessary. For a start, exhausts. There's all sorts of silencers available. A lot of these are called silencers, that's just the name. It's not what they do. 
Um, I'm exaggerating. Maybe you get 10 dB off, but you need 30. Standing a meter away from a high-pressure exhaust, you get 120 dB. You know, you, 10 dB doesn't cut it. So there, and, but people go, ah, oh, back pressure. You can get zero back pressure sensors that can't clog. There's no excuse. I have yet, the only time you can't silence exhaust is when manufacturers make kit with, with slots and little things, which makes it much more difficult to fit a standard silencer. And if you've got lots of ports, then what we suggest is you get some um, plumbing pipe and you manifold them all in and you go down to quick fit and you buy the rear box off any car, 35 dB off, it lasts forever. Very simple. And what I'm talking about is the practicalities of this is because you go onto a site and what we say is, look, how many sciences do you have on this site? And they go, oh, I've got about 60 different designs because every manufacturer uses their own thing. So we say, we need to simplify. Small, medium and large. Just like condoms, you know. Um, and if you do that, you stock a science for each. So in the stores, you have a science that will fit. Because what happens is, you do maintenance on a machine, and it, it breaks down. And they go, oh, we take all these all sciences off, because obviously that's the reason, because they're clogged. Oh, it still doesn't work, so it's not the reason. But in future, the myth is that always, you can't use science on this machine because the back pressure stops it working properly. And the other thing is that if you lose a science, the machine still works. So oh, I've got to go and order this special science that's got to come in from Denmark or something. If you've got one in the stores, it's going to get done. So it's a very simple thing, trying to make it easy to do the right thing. Nozzles, in training nozzles of various types, use in training nozzles, please. 10 dB quieter on average and 20% less compressed air. As Colin will go through all this, I don't want to steal your thunder. And they're also intrinsically safe, you can't block the end. And they pace themselves really, really quickly. So it's really a no-brainer. It's a win-win-win. And they work like this. This is a simple one using what's called the commander effect, and it brings in ambient air and you get better mixing, so it's more efficient and uses less air for the same thrust. <clears throat> this is one which is an example, um, a factory where they use it to sweep up the product down one end for recycling, and they have two blokes whose sole job is to use air lances and walk backs and forwards down the factory all day. And these things are noisy, so... Okay, so I said, right, there's your answer, 15 dB off, pays for itself in a week in compressed air savings. So, you know, that, that's cost you about 200 quid. Uh, and he says, no, not doing it. So why not? It's going to pay for itself in a week. Ah, but the 200 quid comes off my budget. I don't care if it saves comp the company because it's coming off my budget. This is one of the problems is, is procurement. You know, you're not looking at the whole picture here. And this is a very common problem. It's all split into, into silos, and, and my budget, if it saves money off someone else's budget, I don't really care, so I'm not necessarily going to do it. You need to talk to companies about procurement and about the way they manage these sorts of things. <clears throat> this is an example in the power press um, where you're blowing components away as it stamps out the components, like you saw in the video. This is a copper nozzle. This is the clearance, the tool clearance on the press as it goes up and down, and the noise levels. So we're talking about you know, high 90s here. Um, this is a commercially available training nozzle, and this is the one I made, uh, designed, which is still even quieter at, at uh, fixing. So we're talking about you know, uh, a large, very large noise reduction. We're talking about nearly 15 dB or so off for the same thrust on a very high duty activity. Because you're blowing components away, you cannot afford to have a component hang up or you break the press. <clears throat> And this is for um, when you're cleaning your teeth. You look at the bottom of your toothpaste tube. It's heat welded. And what they do is they put the tubes in these cups with the tail upwards between these two cooling nozzles. They call them cooling nozzles. They're just copper pipes with lots of holes in. And so you've got the tail going between to be cooled off once they've made them. And every 10 minutes you get one jumping out because you've got a lot of turbulent air and so on. So it stops the machine. You have to go and fix it. Um, I was going to put enclosure around, uh, but we fitted um, laminar flow coanda in training nozzles and stopped the um, components jumping out and reduced the noise by 12 dBA. And you can So 
So 20% less compressed air, so it pays for itself 12 dBA quieter. Why wouldn't you? Even if it wasn't noisy, you'd still do that. And finally, purchasing policy. Design. How many of you got with companies which have buy quiet policies, those of you who are in an industry? You have. You have. Out of the two of you, uh, how well is it applied? I know it's well applied in your particular case because it's just your job. Um, but is it well applied? Is it policed? It's applied because it's a capital cost first. Yes. Yeah. And this is part of the problem, the way it's policed. You just need to keep it simple and police it. I have sat in a meeting whereby they're applying our purchasing policy, our buy quiet policy, and they've said in the contract, it says, if you do not meet your noise control, your noise levels, we withhold 15% of the capital cost until it is fixed. And when they buy the plant and it comes in and it's 5 dB noise than they said it was going to be, because it's running with product, they go, okay, it's 15%. What are you going to do about it? They go, you, you're going to withhold the money? You know, and after that, they're not going to lie about their noise levels anymore because it costs them money. And you have to, you have to police it. So if we're looking at this, um, long term, it's probably the most cost, single most cost effective thing you can do. But don't let your suppliers spend your money on noise control that is not best practice. One of the things we say is you, if they say they've got a quiet version or something, you say, can I see your diagnostic? process you arrived at this and they will go uh, I have no idea what you're talking about we just bought a load of stuff from a noise control shop um, and so lack of technical expertise with suppliers and also suppliers do not want to change stuff because it means changing their literature and all sorts of things they, they're really scared about changing stuff so the purchasing policy putting pressure I mean this has happened with hand on vibration the manufacturers got the message that vibration is a key part of the purchasing policy because there's no PPE. This should be the same for noise. So the way to do it is, if you're purchasing stuff, you have the power to gradually put more and more pressure on suppliers. So setting, you'd set a target. What you need in a purchasing policy is a target noise level. 78 dBA, 80 dBA is about right. If it passes that, it's never going to be a problem. Between 80 and 85, it may or may, may or not be a problem, depending upon other circumstances, how many, where it's going to be, and all the rest of it. Above that, it's going to be a problem. Uh, but you need to specify operating conditions and where you measure. Otherwise, people will lie. And I'll put too fine a point on it. We've seen this so often. Uh, one company said, oh, your target was 85, and ours comes in 84.8. <laughs> a miracle. It was actually 91 at the operator when you measured it. And they said, no, we can prove it. So what they did, they came over and they said, right, your room is slightly bigger sorry, slightly smaller than the room we measured in, so that's 2 dB. Can I see the calculation for that? And then they measured at the front where the operator stands, they did two measurement positions, and then they did five measurement positions around the back where no one stands and averaged them. Mm -hmm. Miraculously, 84.8. Lying bastards. So um, this is the thing. You, it, you just, all you're interested in is the operator and someone walking by. Those two levels, that's all. Not complicated, no averages, just where people will, will actually get the noise. Um, and ask for details of any noise control I've said, uh, their, their um, diagnostic process. And guidance notes, we provide guidance notes, which is really for the um, specifying engineers. So when you get all these excuses in and explains what a DBA is so they know what it means, um, 5 dB room correction, no, room correction is typically between 1 and 2 dB. So you know all, the, all, all these sorts of things. You know, I've done training buy quiet training programs in large companies, a room full of engineers, I say, right, your purchasing policy, and half the people nod, and all the, half the people go, have we got one of those? And I didn't really realise we had one of those. So there's part of your problem. You need to publicise it and train people, and then police it as part of the contract. Here's one that's very much like what Chris was talking about, special anti-noise guards that don't do anything. It's the rat machine. They um, said, ah, oh, we've got a noise specification. Um, 80, we can meet 85. It was actually 88 to 91 when delivered. And so they said, right, we have these um, double skin guards, which are going to cost you another five, five grand to fit, and these will solve the problem. So I looked at it and said, look, you've got 25% open area in your guards. So the noise is not coming through the guards, it's coming through the open area. And you have to have that open area for access. 
So you cannot get more than 6 dB noise reduction no matter what you do with the guard because the noise isn't going through the guards. This is obvious stuff, but the supplier doesn't know this. So we looked at it in detail, and it's really vibration control from the cams and vibration damping and vibration isolation and a modification to the cams. This one is um, an interesting one because the purchasing policy said uh, this machine, these machines generating 100, up to 105 dBA, which means a whole big area in the production area is noise, is noise hazard zone. I went to, to the company in Europe with the engineers to do proving trials, and they purchased a number of these subject to them implementing my recommendation, which they had agreed to on site. They said, there's no problem in doing that. That's fine. They deliver a standard machine, so the company didn't pay. You said you were going to deliver with modifications. It's like, oh, no, 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 no. Three months later, they deliver a modified machine, okay, which is down to 90 from 105. So it means only the operator has to wear hearing protection. A year later, on their website, new quiet version. Now, but the only reason they did that was because it was policed and the company didn't pay them. They had to be dragged screaming to do it, and then they realized, mm, maybe there's a market. It's, it's, there's a very big resistance to changing machinery. Um, this one is uh, Mollins making machines, they were at making machine many years ago now, but um, <clears throat> we managed to get the noise levels down to just below 85, about 85, with a retrofit kit which cost Mollins 500 quid per machine. And they were selling them for two grand each, and they had 90 advanced orders. So they made a mint out of this. To give you an idea, the modifications were a damped tie between two bearing housings on the lay shaft, higher specification on a gear pair that drove the, um, the tip paper filter tip part, and some damping and some minor local screening with acoustic absorbent. So that costs 500 quid. So it's actually a profitable exercise for them to have a retrofit noise control kit. This is water pumping, 600 horsepower water, water pumps, um, which is a pump and a motor, so in line. And they didn't meet the noise specification. So the pump manufacturer and the motor manufacturer are both blaming each other. And it was going legal. And they're spending a lot of time and money. When we looked at it, it was 95 dBA, and the diagnosis showed that most of the noise was um, electrical vibration radiated by thin panels. So um, the, there we go, that's what it sounds like. <laughs> I know it's electrical because it's 100 hertz all the way up the frequency spectrum, so you know it's not mechanical, it's electrical. And damping. So what was done, whoops, there we go, was retrofit laminated steel on it, solved the problem, and ended all the arguments because it was so cheap to do that there was no point in having solicitors involved and so on. <clears throat> Compare. They wanted to redesign their uh, compressor to get rid of the sensor on the top because it's a really quite an odd one, this, because that meant they could get more into a shipping container, which meant shipping to the Middle East was much cheaper. So that was the main driving force. Um, and diagnosis, how much was coming off the uh, compressor, how much off the fan and, and uh, ventilation and so on. So we managed to get 4 dBA off after the sensor was removed by some aerodynamic fan modifications, tuned acoustic absorbent to specific frequencies, and a load of damping, and... And the machine cost exactly the same amount to build afterwards as before. Uh, crisp packet pick and place, so it's an arm that picks up crisp packets by suction and puts them into a box. Um, this is what they use to generate the suction. This is an Australian um, motor and fan off a model plane, radio control model plane. So again, this was just, they, they, this food factory needs to be hygienic and they were thinking enclosures and sciences and all the rest of it. We just changed the, the way this was mounted and did the aerodynamics and 
um, 8 dBA quieter and didn't cost them anything and made it more effective as well. <coughs> I'm going to get you to do this one. This is pushing components. How do you reduce the noise from that? Lubrication. Sorry, what? Lubrication. Lubrication. They tried that. It's very messy and doesn't always work. Do you find an air outlet? Sorry? An air outlet for... for It isn't actually air escaping. Any others? Yeah? It's uh, vibration in, so flat must stay at the bottom part of the top part. Yeah. It's stick slip. Uh, it's been forced, a force fit. So it, it causes it effectively what happens, it, it starts to do this when it sticks and then moves and then sticks and then moves, which excites the rest of the structure. It's a lot of vibration being fed into it. Isolation work, but the trouble is you're putting a hell of a force into that, so anything you're fitting underneath. Um, but what, looking at the diagnosis, the top one is the average vibration with frequency. But if you look at just a small part of it, you can see regularly, these are resonances in part of the structure. So you just track down where these resonances are and either damp them or put a dynamic vibration absorber on at that frequency, which kills it dead. So it is, again, going back to the diagnostic thing, working out exactly what the problem is before you invent a solution. This is a tray wash used for, well, all, all supermarket, all, all food plastic trays go through tray washes because they recycle them and use them again and again and again. Again, quoted 82 dBA, when it's installed it's 91 dBA, and it was in the contract so they had to do something. Um, the supplier said, you're measuring it wrong, you're not applying a big room correction, and blah, 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 blah. So... Again, the ranking, the air knives the most dominant noise source, so we used, we changed the internals to make, make it into a silencer with waterproof acoustic absorbent and the various other things. And damping on the infeeds, pneumatic, manifolding of pneumatic exhausts, um, cushioning impacts um, using uh, rubber bonded cork, burner intake silencing, a few ge geometric changes we got down from 91 down to 82. The manufacturer had to be dragged screaming to do all these modifications, but now it's their standard kit because it costs less than their original modifications and is um, 9 dB quieter. So again, it's just they hadn't done any diagnosis, they just guessed about the noise control measures that were going to be best. And finally, Eurostar, um, air conditioning plant, very annoying noise, um, a lot of tonal noise and no space. So we worked with the fan manufacturer and chose a better fan. So it was swapping the impeller for a seven-bladed impeller from an eight-bladed impeller. Aerodynamic modifications, some tuned acoustic absorbent, uh, 24 dB off the tonal noise and 8 dB off overall with about 5% reduction in flow, which they thought was acceptable. But these units, you cannot go outside this unit. That's the problem. There's no space. So you can't fit silences and things. You have to do it right basically at source. So just summarizing... Noise risk, 3 dB off. If you get down from 97 to 94, you've halved the risk. Well worth doing if it depends on the cost, but well worth doing. 6 dB off is 75% reduction risk, 10 dB is 90%. And the lower the noise level, the more chance that PPE will work. PPE runs out of steam between 90 and 95 in practical terms to guarantee protection. There's a, we have a massive noise control database, and there's so much information about noise control technology out there. People know about it, like simple materials and things. It just makes such a difference. And to give you hope, this is the one I talked about, the actual dust fan. Massive improvement performance. In other words, you would have done these things just from the performance point of view, even if it wasn't noisy.